Good morning. It is my pleasure to introduce our Grand Rounds presenter today, Dr. Ovidio Bermudez. I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Bermudez on a site visit over five years ago at the Eating Disorder Recovery Program in Denver, Colorado. I was struck by Dr. Bermudez's expertise in the management, knowledge, and compassion of those afflicted with the challenging illness of eating disorders. Dr. Bermudez was born in Havana, Cuba, and attended medical school at the Universidad Central del Este School of Medicine in San Pedro de Macorís, Dominican Republic. He completed his residency in pediatrics at the Medical College of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and went on to complete a fellowship in adolescent and young adult medicine in the Department of Pediatrics, Division of Adolescent Medicine at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Immediately after fellowship, Dr. Bermudez became Director, Division of Adolescent Medicine at Miami Children's Hospital. He then relocated to Vanderbilt Children's Hospital where he was Clinical Director, Division of Adolescent Medicine and Behavioral Sciences, Medical Director of the Adolescent Unit, then Director of the Eating Disorders Program at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, Vanderbilt Children's Hospital. Pursuing his expertise in managing the complex eating disorder illness, he took on the role of medical director at Laureate Psychiatric Clinic and Hospital. Following this, Dr. Bermudez became the medical director of child and adolescent services at the Eating Disorder Recovery Center. His current position is that of senior medical director, child and adolescent services at ERC. He has presented on the complexity of eating disorder illnesses nationally and internationally. Dr. Bermudez is an active member of the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine, American Academy of Pediatrics, Academy for Eating Disorders, National Eating Disorder Association, and the International Association of Eating Disorders. Years ago, upon our meeting, I was struck by Dr. Bermudez and his passion for managing this difficult chronic illness. He noted that I was visiting from Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and remarked on his admiration of the Pittsburgh Pirate baseball player, Roberto Clemente. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, I cannot treat Dr. Bermudez to a well-deserved Pirates game. However, that is an IOU that I hope to keep. Please welcome Dr. Bermudez as he presents his topic, Emerging Eating Pathologies, What and Why. Thank you very much, Dr. Gigtis. That was a, a very kind introduction, and uh, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take you up on that IOU uh, for sure. So, um, well, first of all, it's an honor for me, and um, you know what a what a sign of the times that here we are, um, you know, on a computer screen rather than uh, face to face, which I think is so much more conducive to learning and exchanging and 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 really getting to know uh, people. Um, which is which has been such an enriching and important part of my career, but um, it's a sign of the times, and and here we are. So what I like to do is share with you um, some thoughts around this notion of uh, emerging eating pathologies and and pathologies versus eating disorders is intentional because I think so much is changing um, in in the way these uh, you know the way in the, in the way these pathologies present clinically that um, it's important to have an ear to the ground um, at, you know, as clinicians in, in any clinical setting, uh, but certainly in, in any kind of primary care uh, clinical setting. So um, I have no uh, conflict of interest to disclose to you. Um, and if we take a, a look back, we can see that, you know, the history of, uh, in the English medical literature, uh, the history of eating disorders is, is a rich one. Um, the first um, report uh, as thesis nervosa came from a British physician, Richard Morton, in 1684. Um, and it was, you know, uh, roughly a couple of hundred years later uh, that the, the term anorexia nervosa is coined almost simultaneously by a French physician and another British physician, Lassigue and Gaulle. And it wasn't until about another hundred years that 
um, the first variant of, of restrictive anorexia nervosa uh, is described um, in a seminal paper uh, by a, a British psychiatrist, Dr. Gerald Russell, uh, who described uh, bulimia nervosa as, as an ominous or malignant variant um, of uh, anorexia. And really, uh, the point of that little historical tour uh, is to say that, uh, you know, for a very long time, five centuries, we had a stable, long-standing, single symptom complex that was restrictive anorexia nervosa. And then much later, about 40 years ago, uh, the first single variant was published. And, and so, uh, bulimia came on the scene. Um, and and it, it really wasn't until very recently that these illnesses were recognized as, as a complex psychopathology. Um, they are serious mental illnesses. Um, and as uh, Tom Insel, when he was uh, head of the National Institute of Mental Health, um, described really a brain disorder. Um, this changed the, the scene a lot because we went from uh, blaming families, uh, you know, considering them behavioral disorders, um, uh, et cetera, uh, to really say, look, this is no different than, than uh, severe depression, than severe anxiety, than schizophrenia. Um, these are brain disorders uh, and serious mental illnesses. And despite this, in the last two, two decades, uh, what we have seen is, is a plethora, an emergence of new clinical presentations uh, that encompass a few trends that are interesting uh, broader gender representation. So today we need to be thinking about eating disorders in all genders. Um, broader age representation. I think today we need to be thinking about eating disorders across the lifespan. Um, uh, I think that in, in my clinical experience, the youngest uh, person that I've diagnosed with an eating disorder has been six years old um, and the oldest has been 82 years old. I think that covers the lifespan. Um, this, this is an interesting uh, phenomenon. This, we've, we've also seen uh, some, uh, some drifts that are, that are unexplainable uh, so far. And, and one of those is this erosion of what once appeared to be uh, social cultural factors. I'll, I'll touch base on that a little later. And of course, including all races and all ethnicities. So, um, uh, you know, we went from five, five centuries ago talking about Caucasian women of European descent descent predominantly representing those affected by eating disorders to a very, very different picture today um, as we just discussed. So just a few years ago, um, you know, prior to May of 2013, uh, under the fourth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, we would have had published clinical criteria for three um, eating disorders, uh, anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, uh, an eating disorder not otherwise specified. I, 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 you know, it, it helps to remember that binge eating disorder was buried under um, uh, eating disorder not otherwise specified with only really um, research criteria uh, published, not really uh, clinical criteria per se. And then with the advent of the fifth edition of the DSM, we now have published diagnostic criteria for eight uh, different eating disorders. Um, and of course, anorexia and bulimia and binge eating disorder kind of being at the heart of that. Uh, but then we see this uh, other specified feeding and eating disorder uh, or unspecified feeding and eating disorders um, as sort of the catch broader categories. Um, and we see RFID, rumination disorder, and pica, um, which certainly were more and still are uh, more of an issue in children and, and sort of uh, uh, smaller uh, subsets of the population, but uh, that's changing as well. Um, so uh, let's talk about some of these, uh, you know, what are we seeing as, as emerging uh, manifestations of um, eating disorders or eating pathologies in general. And what I like to do is touch on, on three syndromes. Um, first of all, uh, one that I, I, you know, it's near and dear to my heart. Um, I've written extensively about it, and and I think it's something that that you know anybody um, you know in the front lines interacting with patients, especially if you're interacting with patients with uh, type one diabetes, needs to keep in mind. And that is what the media has dubbed diabulimia. Um, I prefer to call it the dual diagnosis of eating disorder, 
and diabetes mellitus type 1 or EDDM type 1. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about ARFID, avoid and restrictive food intake disorder. Um, you know, what is it and what are, what are we seeing? I think that I think we're going to see more ARFID in the future as, as um, you know, as a, as a main manifestation than even anorexia nervosa. And then this new term, uh, atypical anorexia nervosa, which is really classified under other specified feeding and eating disorder in the DSM-5, uh, but a real syndrome and uh, an important one at that. So let's, um, let's cover a little bit of ground and then we'll end talking a bit about why. Why are we seeing these, uh, the emergence of new presentations and the like, and of course, um, uh, be able to touch a bit on, on some thoughts around, um, hopefully, to stimulate your, your interest and your reading um, in these pathologies. So let's talk about uh, EDDM uh, type one. Uh, first of all, I'll tell you that um, the term diabulimia, which, which the press has continued to use, and, and you actually even see in the medical literature, uh, is, is not my preferred term. And the reason for that is <clears throat> that, I mean, first of all, I, I don't like the context of diabolical and, and that, you know, I think we need to be very sensitive um, in that sense. Um, but most importantly, it, it's no longer representative of what was originally described. So diabulimia came from the fact that the original, the initial early reports um, of type people with type one diabetes that would binge eat, um, they, would, they would take care of their diabetes and cover with insulin for you know, the usual eating through the day. But if they had a binge, then they would withhold the insulin uh, for that binge as a form of purging. And hence the notion that this was a, a combination of diabetes and bulimia because the, the main intent early on was um, to, to purge the calories from a binge. Now, as, as we'll discuss, that has changed significantly. I was very fortunate to be invited to a consensus conference um, uh, back in 09 at the University of, of Minnesota uh, and this group of researchers, clinicians, um, academicians um, uh, sort of chiseled out um, what was later published. And I think I have to show you uh, as a resource um, that issue of, uh, uh, that was published in, as the proceeds of this consensus conference. Um, and, and this definition got chiseled out. So um, uh, EDDM type 1 refers to the intentional omission of prescribed insulin. If you're not a type 1 diabetic and you use insulin, it's, you become hypoglycemic. There, there is no, there's no weight loss potential there by either strategically decreasing, delaying, or completely omitting um, insulin for the purpose of inducing hyperglycemia and thus rapidly losing calories in the urine in the form of glucose and inducing weight loss or avoidance of weight gain. So clearly, the driver here is dry for thinness, is, is, a, is, a, is a desire um, to either lose weight or prevent weight gain um, as the driving force behind this. Um, this is probably, uh, this is a busy slide, but I'll, I'm going to summarize it for you here next. Um, it's called the, the modified dual pathway. Um, and it essentially says that in the solid arrows, we have the well-established pathways by which uh, people with type 1 diabetes may end up with disordered eating behaviors, um, you know, based on some um, physiological factors um, uh, like weight gain, for example, and based on some psychological factors uh, like negative affect uh, related to blood sugar fluctuations and the sort of the lack of success um, with, um, um, you know, insulin uh, diabetes management. But then the broken arrows say, look, there, there are perhaps even uh, more complicated uh, and more complex ways in which we get from point A to point B, including uh, some um, uh, physiological issues related to type 1 diabetes, like, um, you know, hunger and, and satiety disruption uh, through the um, uh, altered pathways in, in ghrelin production, for example. Uh, so it's not as simple as um, you know, it's all psychological or it's all about blood glucose control. I think that diabetes is a, a complex illness um, and, and some of that complexity may actually lead to dysregulated eating, binge eating, um, uh, food restrictions, lack of appetite, et cetera, et cetera, uh, 
uh, at different times. So these are the, the four um, sort of the disease-based mechanisms through which uh, people with, especially youth with type 1 diabetes may uh, actually end up with dysregulated, dysregulated eating behaviors. So uh, car carb counting, uh, driving imposed food preoccupation. And, and obviously, you know, if you've been carb counting since you were diagnosed with diabetes, which is uh, often the case, um, or at some point begin to carb count as you, as you grow up with your diabetes, uh, then it's something that most of us are not really thinking about. Um, and these are, these are uh, people that sort of grow up with that necessity, if you will. So there is a focus on, you know, food and food amount and food content that otherwise uh, probably wouldn't be there. Weight fluctuations are associated with variable use of insulin. Uh, and then those weight fluctuations, especially beginning in the preteen, teen years, um, begin to lead to uh, body dissatisfaction. So when weight goes up, body dissatisfaction goes up. Uh, when weight goes down, body dissatisfaction improves and patients sort of uh, learn and, and tie um, you know, some of their psychological developmental um, you know, self-definition issues around that. Blood glucose fluctuations associated with mismatched uh, insulin dose. Uh, so for example, excessive caloric intake um, uh, once a per person notices hypoglycemia, and this may result in, in periods of weight gain uh, when the diabetes is, is less well managed or less well controlled. Um, and the response to hypoglycemia may actually condition or, or trigger binge-like episodes. So really eating and eating enough to address the hypoglycemia uh, when not hungry. So um, it begins to be an external cue rather than an internal cue uh, of, of hunger uh, towards an episode of eating that, that may condition some people with diabetes uh, to, for the likelihood of on, uh, ongoing binge behaviors. It's a, of interest that if you have heard that anorexia nervosa has the highest mortality rate of all psychiatric illnesses, and until recently that was very much true. Um, however, with the opioid epidemic, I think that, 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 that has been challenged a little bit. Um, but even further, um, uh, EDDM type one sort of challenges that. So this, this is a study uh, done by Nielsen. Uh, uh, the data was sort of reviewed and, and published uh, in two separate um, occasions. Uh, and it looks at uh, mortality rates per thousand person years. These are not percentages. Um, and for diabetes uh, type one alone, in their data set, there were 2.2 deaths per thousand person years. For anorexia nervosa alone, it was 7.3 deaths per thousand person years. That actually translates into a crude mortality rate of about 6.5% per decade of disease with anorexia, which is right in line with what um, the eating disorder literature reflects. Um, but the concurrent, the, 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 the dual diagnoses of both increased the mortality rate to 34.6 uh, per thousand person years. So, 17 times the mortality rate of diabetes alone and five times the mortality rate of anorexia nervosa alone. Um, and I think that's really uh, important to hone in on uh, because once you make this diagnosis, um, I think this has to be in the back of our minds. Hence that uh, one of the recommendations of this um, consensus group was that patients with type one diabetes that are then diagnosed with an eating disorder should be considered, not automatically, uh, but uh, considered for medical inpatient stabilization or um, eating disorder inpatient treatment due to the high mortality and uh, high morbidity and increased mortality risk associated um, with, with both of these conditions and, and much more so when they coexist. So um, at Eating Recovery Center, um, you know, we have a pretty sophisticated um, sort of management protocol uh, that starts with a comprehensive intake assessment, travel safety. We do a multidisciplinary comprehensive assessment on admission that includes medical, psychiatric, nutritional, psychological team assessments. The psychiatric piece is very important. Remember that the suicide risk in eating disorders um, is also higher than in any other mood disorder, including higher than depression, uh, higher than bipolar disorder. Um, individualized treatment plans that are here to the core principles of treatment, but then individualized 
um, the care where it's, where it's applicable and, and, and better, if you will, core principles of treatment referring to things as if you're underweight, weight recovery is, is um, uh, you know, very important uh, in the successful treatment of any eating disorder presentation. If you stunted your growth as a kid, uh, growth catch up becomes very important. Those are core issues. Um, and then comes um, sort of the other more individualized approaches. Um, and all also uh, based on a level system for the, uh, what we call the diabetes management uh, protocol, levels A through the, D, which sort of, uh, uh, you know, under the, the premise of this notion of, hey, look, if, if you're now diagnosed with this dual diagnosis of EDDM T1, we're going to assume care for the diabetes uh, so that gradually you resume care for the diabetes, uh, including insulin pump removal when that has been in the mix, um, later to return to insulin pump use, but when it's uh, uh, medically and psychiatrically safe, if you will. Um, a couple of helpful resources. Uh, uh, the, on the left is the issue of diabetes spectrum published in the summer of 09. This is still very, very relevant. Um, very little has changed um, in that time frame. And the second is a book uh, uh, published, uh, edited by Phil Mailer and Arnie Anderson. Um, and in here, there is a chapter on uh, this dual diagnosis, uh, and it's a comprehensive chapter. Um, the fourth edition of this book is already in its making, and it will also include some updates um, uh, in that EDDM type one uh, chapter. Um, there is um, a modification. If any of you are familiar with the SCOF questionnaire, it's a validated five question uh, screening tool uh, for eating disorders in general. Um, and in, in the case, the, the, the modified SCOF uh, modifies the fifth question to add this. Uh, do you ever take less insulin than you should? Um, and it's a, it's a clever question because any, any, any person that understands their diabetes can certainly know where you're coming from. Um, and again, this has been validated and it's a helpful tool. So we're not talking about extensive questionnaires. I think that in the front lines, um, you know, in clinical settings, we, we're talking about uh, brief questionnaires. So I hope that gets you, gives you a feel for EDDM type one. Um, let's shift gears a little bit and talk a, a bit about ARFID. Uh, new kid on the block, um, here are the diagnostic criteria. Um, you know, they, they essentially say uh, that these are people um, that uh, you know, have an eating or feeding disturbance based on one of two things. So, so avoid and restrictive implies a bifurcation by definition there. Um, so either their avoidance, their avoidance is based on sensory characteristics of food or concern about um, you know, uh, negative consequences of eating like hurting and choking, or they're restrictive. They, 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 they have an apparent lack of interest in food, eating, low appetite drive, et cetera. Um, it's not associated with drive for thinness. So the, the point is now that these people are saying, like in anorexia, I want to be smaller and I want to lose weight, uh, but it is associated with significant weight loss, failure to uh, failure to grow appropriately, um, uh, you know, nutritional deficiencies, dependence on enteral um, feeding or oral uh, liquid supplements. So many of these patients come in uh, only existing on Pediasure or Ensure or the like, and and this criterion A4 is important because it essentially says that. Um, uh, you meet these criteria, so it's, it's one of the four. Um, so with marked interference with psychosocial functioning, which means that you could have grown normally, you can be of normal height, of normal weight, not have nutritional deficiencies, um, and yet the, the marked interference with psychosocial functioning fulfills the criteria. Um, and we run into this phenomena of, of people for whom this is uh, that type of an issue rather than a weight and, and growth type of issue. Um, and then it, it cannot coexist with anorexia or bulimia. So the, the criteria are mutually exclusive. That's really important um, because uh, kids at risk for ARFID um, based on their personality makeup, uh, personal characteristics are also at risk for anorexia. And so uh, uh, there's a good number of these people that cross over from ARFID to anorexia, especially in, in the mid to late teenage years. Uh, so ear to the ground on that. And, and of course, this is not 
uh, primary psychosis or an undiagnosed malignancy. Uh, so if there is a, a primary psychiatric other than the eating issue or a primary medical issue causing uh, the disturbance and you address that and the, the eating disturbance goes away, then, then that's not our fit. Um, so what it is, I think the elevator message is a serious eating disorders. It's not, it's not a lesser eating disorder whose medical complications are commensurate, if not identical, um, to that of anorexia nervosa when our fit uh, uh, involves being underweight and malnourished. For non-underweight and non-malnourished our fit patients under that criterion A4, uh, then this, this is not, that's not a true statement from that perspective. But for the majority of patients with our fit, it is, it is the case. Um, the incidence and the prevalence are unknown. Um, I think we need to remember that um, contrary to the history of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the, the DSM, which has been more driven by data um, and evidence-based, um, both diagnostic and treatment approaches, uh, this was different. This was a break with that. So, so little is really known about our fit, especially, especially outside of childhood. Um, and yet, the, the, the observation that these this was a, a important clinical manifestation of an eating pathology that was seen and noted. And even though uh, this DSM-5 committee on, on eating disorders did not have all the data that they would have liked, uh, it, was, it was included uh, for that purpose. So it kind of broke with that trend historically. This is still more common in children and young adolescents by far. Uh, less common, but not absent in late adolescence and throughout adulthood, present throughout the lifespan in all genders. I think that's important to emphasize um, and, and often associated with psychiatric comorbidity, but in, in differentiating it from uh, anorexia, uh, for example, there's more anxious and obsessive compulsive features in ARFID patients and by far less depressive features. Uh, in our in our fit patients compared to that of um, of anorexia nervosa. Here's a, a couple of uh, recently published uh, articles um, that that looked at um, the prevalence uh, both in in non clinical samples and in clinical samples. And as you can see, and I highlighted in, in yellow because that's the punchline, um, the the preliminary es estimates. Um, in eating disorder clinical populations range from 1.5 to 64%. That's a, that's a broad uh, variation. And in non-clinical cohorts from less than 1% to 15.5%. So again, I think, I think at this time, um, we cannot say we have a pretty good understanding of, of you know, how common ARFID uh, uh, really is. It is a new diagnosis. Uh, many clinicians are not familiar I think that's gradually improving, but gradually. Um, many, many are not familiar with the diagnostic criteria. Um, and, and this often leads to two things, either uh, misdiagnosis or delay in diagnosis. And um, I just have just a couple of caveats. The, what, one of the misdiagnoses, uh, you know, has a lot to do with, um, you know, sort of, sort of blaming this or, or conceptualizing it as part of true food intolerance issues. Um, and so that exacerbates the problem because that often leads to a elimination diets and you know, sort of efforts to, to um, accommodate the system to better tolerate nutritional intake. Um, and, and because this is a mental illness, first and foremost, uh, that type of accommodation tends to lead to further restriction rather than to solving the problem, even if at times there are you know, honeymoon phases, if you will. Um, and then the, the, the really uh, important misdiagnosis to avoid is calling this anorexia nervosa. Um, these, when, when that happens, my experience has been that people tend to feel very much like they're not well seen um, because they, they can tell you, I don't have anorexia. And oftentimes that is true, that is the case. Um, they have ARFI um, in their different uh, presentations. And delaying diagnosis tends to lead to extensive medical workups. Um, you know, we're, we're a tertiary care national referral uh, center, if you will. Um, and, and so we see a lot of people who, you know, have, have had diagnostic therapeutic efforts. Um, and again, uh, you know, for me, it's hard to understand why somebody 
you know, in the course of two, three, four years would have had five colonoscopies. Um, uh, so important to be thoughtful about um, how we assess. And, and, and there is a medical differential diagnosis that needs to be taken into account. Um, the clinical presentations vary widely and evolve with both the, develop, the developmental context, the age of presentation, um, the age of onset of the illness, uh, the lack of drive for thinness is very confusing sometimes for families. Um, you know, these are patients that are saying, I wish I ate more, I wish I weighed more. Um, and that's different in the context of an eating disorder. We, you know, we're more set on that notion of, I wish, you know, I don't want to eat and I wish I weighed less um, in anorexia. And the medical complications are very similar to that. I don't actually have went on the way we mentioned that. I mentioned the bifurcation by definition. We are now working on five subtypes of RFID uh, that I'd like to briefly uh, share with you. Uh, we call them, uh, so the, the uh, avoidant, we've divided into avoidant and aversive. The restrictive arm, we've left of restrictive or observing a mixed type and an RFID plus, which um, I will explain. Um, so avoidant really uh, refers to uh, people who have this sort of phobic avoidance stance. Um, they refuse food or limit their food intake related to uh, trying to, to avoid uh, aversive experiences, fear-based experiences related to food, choking, global sensation, nausea, vomiting, pain, swallowing. Uh, <laughs> even since the DSM-5, uh, probably in the last two years, this notion of avoidance of, of you know, based on this phobia of anaphylaxis um, has sort of evolved and we're admitting uh, kids and adults with, uh, you know, I mean, one thing is to have a peanut allergy and, and you should be fearful of exposure to peanuts if you've had anaphylaxis before. But if you become, if this takes a phobic proportion, now, you know, you, you can be on the second floor of a building where somebody maybe on the 10th floor, um, you know, has a peanut butter sandwich uh, and, and that, that becomes really incapacitating. Um, the aversive subtype uh, uh, is really about avoiding the, the sensory sensitivity and avoiding um, you know, aversive sensory experience. Sometimes these are only focused on food, the color, the smell, the texture uh, in the mouth, uh, the sight, um, uh, and, and sometimes it spills over to other uh, avoidance of other sensory experiences. Um, some of these patients are uh, you know, just like you talk about super feelers, some of these patients are super tasters. Um, so the avoidance is not of a, a sensation per se, but the overwhelming sense that uh, a certain type of taste may actually produce for these individuals and, and sensory processing disorders sometimes um, needs to be thought about um, and appropriately assessed for um, in these patients. The restrictive subtype really talks about a low appetite drive type of a uh, group of people, uh, often starting with extreme pickiness at a young age, um, distractible and forgetful gamers, uh, uh, often clearly saying, I wish I ate more, I, I, just, I just don't. Um, and sometimes fitting into the um, autism spectrum, so uh, cognitively rigid, uh, you know, obsessive and somewhat compulsive in some of their other activities, but certainly not obsessive and compulsive about eating. The mixed type is when these types mix. Uh, most commonly, we see somebody who's been restrictive for life and then has a, or witnesses a choking episode. And now they sort of, they sort of uh, uh, you know, now have acquired, um, you know, these, these um, uh, avoidant features, uh, for example. And, and therapeutically, that matters. And, and just about any combination is possible. Uh, we've even seen some ARFID with binge eating disorder, which is a, a pretty interesting um, sort of uh, perhaps subtype that may evolve in the future. We haven't seen enough to really think about it that way. And then RFID plus is really interesting. Um, you know, you have this, this uh, young person, for example, you know, who's grown up with, you know, an RFID presentation of whatever subtype we may be talking about. And then they hit uh, adolescence and they become, um, they still have RFID and they, but they're beginning to become more concerned about their body size, their body weight, their body shape. Um, and so the context of their conversation changes a little. For example, in the last example, um, you know, as you guys may very well know, um, you know, most ARFIC kids have really existed, survived on uh, calorically dense foods, right? The, the three most typical foods are uh, chicken fingers, uh, macaroni and cheese, and pizza. 
Um, so that those are not foods preferred by people with anorexia nervosa because they're calorically dense. Um, so if you've grown up as an ARFID kid and most of your life you existed on this sort of um, small repertoire of calorically dense foods and you now become preoccupied with becoming overweight, um, uh, you may actually begin to modify the caloric density of those foods you've preferred and liked and maybe survived on. Um, and, and that refers to this plus stance. Once they cross over, if they develop body image dissatisfaction, drive for thinness, body image distortion, they now meet criteria for anorexia nervosa. They're no longer our fit. And remember uh, that the diagnostic criteria are mutually exclusive. So you cannot have our fit and anorexia. Um, management approaches. I mentioned the core principles of treatment for all types, for restrictive our fit types. Um, we really focus on structured eating. We just you know, we schedule the food in front of them. Most of the time they're willing to eat it. Um, and, and we have a family-based therapy, emotion-focused family therapy sort of uh, in form, um, complementary to the structured eating. For avoidant and aversive RFID, the focus is on um, exposure and response prevention with a emotion-focused family therapy uh, approach. Uh, for mixed RFID, um, you know, we, we try to uh, unravel what, what sort of came forth and sometimes treat that most recently acquired uh, sort of manifestation and then eventually go back to address the more stable or long-standing manifestation. And I put here for RFID Plus, proceed with caution. And the reason for that is, is that um, you, you don't want to contribute to the, to the evolution or the crossover um, from RFID to anorexia. And, and I got to tell you that, um, you know, one of the observations, um, and, and again, you know, as a tertiary care national referral center, one of the observations in kids is that, you know, many times they consider um, their eating disorder triggered uh, by a comment. And sometimes it's by somebody in a position of authority. So sometimes it's been a coach, sometimes it's been a health teacher, but many times it's been a, you know, their, their primary care provider or pediatrician. So I think we gotta be thoughtful about the impact of our words. And I'm not implying by that, that I think that a single comment uh, causes an eating disorder. I, I, I think that would be naive. Um, you know, this is, these are complex psychopathologies, so there's more to it than that. And yet, we should be very sensitive of, you know, in our choice of words and where they land. So the treatment is based on exposures and exposures and exposures because you well know that the brain learns by repetition. So, you know, we undo the limitations by exposing to a broader range of foods, normalizing weight, normalizing eating behaviors, normalizing eating times, um, and hopefully with the repetitiveness of, of practicing, um, the brain learns and, and these people move on um, and, and improve. The outcome data is, is very limited, likely variable, depending on the subtype, the age of onset, the age of presentation, how long has the course of illness sort of been cementing in place, um, if you will. Um, but I think we have much to learn still about this. And then finally, um, I want to sort of touch base on this uh, new terminology of uh, atypical anorexia nervosa. Um, you know, I, I question and I think a lot of people in this field question whether there is anything atypical about this. It's just, it's just you know, um, we're looking at something different, and because of that, we may be labeling it typical. Um, this may just be anorexia nervosa in, in people with, you know, uh, larger bodies, if you will. Um, but I think, I think there's some benefit to the atypia right now so that people think about it um, and, and sort of bring it under the fold of the repertoire of things that uh, they may be concerned with. Um, you know, in, in, in a clinical presentation. And, and remember that this is under other specified feeding and eating disorder. That should be the diagnosis on the chart, uh, not atypical anorexia. So if anything, it should, you know, officially it should be the other way. It should be OSFED and perhaps qualified as atypical anorexia. So uh, these are individuals that meet all the criteria for anorexia nervosa, except uh, that despite the weight loss that has occurred, the individual's weight is within or above the normal range. Um, so, you know, good example, somebody that weighs 
um, you know, 100% of what they're supposed to, their ideal body weight, they weigh 100 pounds, uh, they lose half their body weight, they now weigh 50 pounds, and we know that that is alarming, right? That's a, that's a significant percent of weight loss, huge. Um, well, if somebody weighs 2x what they're supposed to, they're supposed to weigh 100 pounds and they weigh 200 pounds and they lose 100 pounds, they have just absolutely normalized weight, but they're just as malnourished and just as much at risk. Um, that's a huge amount of weight loss, especially if it happens in a relatively short period of time. Um, so what a, a, one of the things that atypical anorexia has taught us is that um, the real medical risks of weight loss have to do with the total amount of weight loss and the rate of weight loss. Um, that's really what, what recruits survival physiology and challenges um, the system um, uh, and, and may lead to the, the severe complications that are known. Um, the medical complications are very similar. Um, in this particular study uh, published by Sawyer, uh, no significant differences in resting pulse rate, frequency of bradycardia, marked orthostatic changes, hypothermia, or require um, uh, medical hospitalization for st stabilization. Um, uh, no differences in measures of binge eating, purging, psychiatric comorbidity, um, including depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive features, uh, use of psychotropic medications, self-harm, suicidal uh, concerns, um, and a variety of depressive and obsessive compulsive symptomatology. Um, however, the difference was that people with atypical anorexia were more likely to have a, a, um, a history uh, of meeting BMI criteria for over, o, overweight or obese um, and were less likely to experience amenorrhea. So that was the, that was the one difference. Um, and, and it's really unclear as to why if you drop your heart rate and you drop your body temperature, why would you continue to menstruate? Um, that's unclear. So um, if, if this conversation would have taken place a decade ago, um, it would have been unheard of to use the terms normal weighted or overweight referring to anorexia nervosa. That, that would have been hard to, uh, hard to reconcile. And yet, uh, here we are. So um, the playing field is changing. Um, and, and I guess it, it leads to the question then as to why. Um, and so I, I like to share some of my own thoughts with you around this. Um, you know, I don't know that there is a whole lot of li literature specifically uh, relating to this, um, but um, you know, my, my thought, my thoughts are the following: Are we tapping into new yet layers of genetic vulnerability? So you know, we know that most psychopathology is based on this concept of genetic environment interaction. You've got to have the latent. Uh, vulnerability potential, if you will, that when it when this interacts with certain life experiences, environmental circumstances, um, it it rears the the, the uh, sort of the phenotypical expression of that psychopathology. That's true of depression. That's true of anxiety. That's true of anorexia. That's true of bulimia. Um, so, um, you know, are we tapping into new layers? So, you know, we're seeing different manifestations because we're recruiting different um, you know, latent vulnerability um, in, in different groups of human beings. That's a possibility. And that may be based on two things. Um, the, the fact that pervasive stress um, is related to increasing life complexity and we need to rethink stress. Um, and then the fact that overwhelming stimuli may be, really be challenging our, our neurobiology and, and how we tolerate this. Um, here's a, a a little bit of a, just a reminder of this whole um, genetic environment interaction, the in, inheritability estimates, the heritability of anorexia and bulimia is very high, um, you know, up there with that of autism and, and schizophrenia. Um, so, um, you know, important to say, yes, these are, these are familial illnesses um, that are genetically mediated, not inherited as a specific gene, but inherited as a set of personality characteristics and psychiatric comorbidities uh, that rendered an individual more or less vulnerable to the influence of environmental factors. Um, so, so, you know, taking that into account, we can say, I, I love this scattergram, um, we can say that if we divide this into four quadrants, um, we can pretty much say that 
uh, genetically resistant populations to, exp to the expression of A phenotype that, that live in a protective environment in the left lower quadrant uh, have very little expression of the phenotype. Even genetically prone populations that live in a protective environment have limited expression of the phenotype in the right lower quadrant. Um, however, if we move to a promoting environment, um, even in a genetically resistant population, we, we begin to pick off, if you will, the more vulnerable, um, and there is greater expression of the phenotype. And of course, in a genetically prone population uh, in the right upper quadrant that, that lives in a promoting environment, then we see very significant expression of the phenotype. Um, and I think that, that we have been there with anorexia and bulimia, and we're now uh, seeing some of that. We're sort of picking off um, sort of different vulnerability um, uh, uh, groups, if you will, uh, because our environment is so promoting uh, in this day and age. So another way of thinking about it is that, look, if we've been living with level A environmental influence, um, you know, for the last five centuries, um, then we saw anorexia and bulimia as, as the eating pathologies um, that, um, that showed up, if you will. But we've moved. Uh, the complexity of our lives have moved, and we're now seeing at, at level B, and we're seeing binge eating disorder, RFID, uh, EDDM type 1, atypical anorexia nervosa, in addition to anorexia and bulimia. And perhaps most interesting to me is that, you know, as as life complexities and environmental influences continue to change, and they will, um, then, you know, how do we consider the impact of that and, and what are we going to see as manifestations of not just um, uh, eating pathologies or, uh, you know, I, I think we need to sort of be thoughtful about the fact that, you know, this may be the reason or, or part of the reason or one way to conceptualize why so many kids are self-harming why suicide risk um, is, is much greater right now than probably ever uh, before, et cetera. So um, our perception of stress has been that of an external stimuli uh, that, is, that has a negative connotation. Um, it's a negative perception, a challenge, a difficulty. Um, and I think that that, that has been accurate. Um, and yet, I think we may need to begin to look at, at uh, stress um, as the impact of exposures um, that we have not evolved the tolerance to uh, and tolerate only with negative downstream um, neurobiological consequences. Um, so so our, our, our brains sort of have no choice but to tolerate these exposures and then pay a price. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's, 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 it's hard um, to think, uh, you know, how, how do we how do we understand this and how do we modify this, if you will? Um, this is Times Square. So if any of you have been there, I love it, uh, but can only tolerate it for a few hours. After that, I have to sort of uh, withdraw from this type of stimulus. And, and my, you know, what I propose is that if you spend a couple of hours in an environment like this, um, you may have heard more sound, seen more lights, smell more smells than, um, you know, uh, you've been exposed to more, um, you know, complexity, if you will, than, than some of our great grandparents, perhaps in, in their entire lifetime. Um, it, it, you know, so um, it, it's, it's that overstimulation that I think um, we may be paying a price for. You know, we're looking at these computer screens, they're sophisticated machines. They bring a lot in, um, even, in a, even in a simple context like this. Um, so is the toxicity of our environment uh, may, may not only be mediated by negative experience, natural disasters, trauma, et cetera, but also by ex exposure, perhaps overexposure to positive stimuli that we've created to improve our lives. So are we exceeding our brain's capacity to tolerate external stimuli um, of the good and the bad kind? Um, and, and it's a question. I, I certainly do not like the answer. So um, the takeaways, uh, for this morning are, um, uh, you know, we're likely to learn more about the effect of stress and exposures on neurobiological function. I think that, that many people are raising that question. Uh, in the meantime, I think that we are uh, going to see um, yet 
more different manifestations and variants of eating pathology. So, um, you know, ear to the ground uh, from that perspective, because I don't, I don't think we've seen the last of emergence um, in, in this accelerated way that we've seen in the last um, couple of decades. And then um, all of this is pre-COVID-19. Pre uh, what will this pandemic change in mental health risks of children, adolescents, adults, um, with and without eating disorders? Uh, and I think the, that we're still learning and the jury is out. Uh, I saw in the initial presentation that you know, some of your faculty has uh, published on, on you know, this, including the, uh, the effect of COVID-19 on di diabetes management. Um, and, and my goodness, I, I think we're going to learn a whole lot that we are not aware of that yet. I wanna uh, end by mentioning that there are uh, certain medical comorbidities that lend themselves to, to the mismanagement of their care um, and, and thus lead to people intentionally inducing uh, weight loss. So it's not just diabetes and insulin withholding, but the same can occur with hypothyroidism hyperthyroidism, cystic fibrosis, inflammatory bowel disease, and this focus on food intolerance, uh, you know, lactase deficiency, celiac disease, non-celiac uh, gluten intolerance, um, you know, food allergies. Uh, so people, people with eating disorders tend to present, um, you know, with a higher experience uh, than the general population uh, in, in all of these um, uh, cited. Um, and, and of course, I think it's sort of leaning on that preoccupation with um, health uh, and well-being that, that uh, we as a society seem to be um, struggling with in some ways. So I hope that um, uh, you will have an opportunity to sort of uh, get interested, get curious about this. Um, my sense is that uh, this is a young, eating disorders is a young field and a, and a field that, um, you know, where we're learning a lot. Uh, and learning a lot, not only as we go clinically, but as we study and research and, and sort of try to set some roots to this, to this young field. Um, so uh, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to, um, I, I know that we're gonna have some uh, breakout rooms or chat rooms a little later and, and happy to um, hear any perspective uh, or answer any questions to the extent that I can. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bermudez, that, that was, wonderful, inspiring, and it reaches so many of us in different subspecialties as well as general pediatrics. I am going to read some of the um, questions and answers uh, that are in the Q&A. Um, the first one I think you did already answer, it's could you speak to restrictive eating in high BMI patients? I, I believe that you did answer that in the atypical um, when you're discussing the atypical anorexia nervosa? Sure, and, and, and the only thing I like to add to that is that I think as, as, you know, as clinicians, um, we should not thoughtlessly cheer on somebody um, you know, with a high BMI that starts to sort of down the path of dietary restriction. Um, so you know, uh, medically supported weight loss is very different than restrictive eating. This, this is actually, in my book, a really important question and a really important thing to underline is that we need to be really careful. Um, you know, what, what tends to happen with weight loss um, is that we high five weight loss, right? As a general rule of thumb, right? Uh, we don't, even us, even us medical professionals, you know, we don't run into a friend and say, you look great, you've put on some weight. That, that's not the way in, in, in our societal context, we approach this, right? If, we, if we're gonna comment is you look great because you lost some weight. Um, so I think we gotta be careful because we don't understand the genetics of that genetic environment interaction. Um, and, you know, for the high BMI patient who begins down the path of restrictive eating, the vast majority of them are not going to hold on to restrictive eating but there are a few of them um, that have the genetic potential to actually hold on to restrictive eating and develop what could be a life-threatening illness. Um, so I think we need to be really thoughtful and I, I find it a very good question. Okay, great. And then the next one um, is, 
in chronic conditions that you mentioned toward the end, things like people with cystic fibrosis, IBD, other GI conditions, um, what's the best way to screen among these chronic conditions? You know, I, I like I like the question in the modified scoff, the fifth question, um, have you ever used less insulin than you should? Um, and and I think it's a it's a crafty way because you know most of these patients with these chronic conditions have been well educated. They understand their illness by and large. They understand um, the therapeutic efforts. Um, so you know in 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 hypothyroidism, you know I would modify that question to say, have you ever used more synthroid than you should? Um, you know. In, in hyperthyroidism, I would sort of modify the question to say, have you actually taken less tapazole than you should? Um, uh, you know, in, in cystic fibrosis, you know, are you, are you uh, adequately using your digestive enzymes? Um, you know, have you used your vest? We, we've ran into, I think we've, we've been on the fifth patient with CF, um, who used a, a, a chest vibration vest, you know, upwards of 10 hours a day. Um, just think about that for a minute. Um, and again, hard, hard to think of that, but that's what compulsive behaviors tend to do. They, they allow people to do things that, you know, the, the average human simply cannot accomplish. I mean, you know, how do, how do you exist on 200, 300 calories a day for, you know, days and days and weeks and weeks and months on end. Well, you don't, and, and except if you develop uh, uh, an illness that has such compulsive behavior sort of tied to it. Um, so again, I think it's about being savvy enough to, to, to know what your patient is supposed to be doing and just a little bit of an inquiry as to, look, are you doing this correctly? Are you misusing this in any way, shape or form? Um, and, and the way you craft that question has to, to be developmentally appropriate. Um, so, um, you know, again, uh, it, it's understanding the relationships um, of, of these medical entities and how they may be misused to serve the intent to lose weight. Okay, and then this, this is a toughie, um, I think. Um, it says, can you comment on patients with anorexia nervosa um, who have parents who seem to have orthorexia. They only eat healthy food, exercise is a very important and valued part of their life. Um, I've started to see patients with anorexia where this is the family, like a family situation, a family pathology. Yeah, um, it, it, is, it is a tough subject, but I'll, I'll give you a two-sided coin answer. Um, the first side of the coin is, this is a tough situation because, you know, you're now, um, you know, you're now uh, working with a parent and, and we now know that parents are the most important allies that we have in treating children with eating disorders. Um, so the, the family-based treatment approaches have really taught us that. Um, so, but there are complexities to um, having grown up with a parent with an eating disorder or just, you know, significant orthorexia or the like, because some of these may be lifelong parents, I mean, uh, patterns, you know, we're talking about parents that may, um, you know, fat restrict their kids since they're little, um, infants, um, you know, where their views of caloric intake are, are very skewed and the notion that somebody uh, you know, might need to eat more than 1,400, 1,500 calories a day is, you know, outrageous in their mind. Um, and these are things that have an impact, especially if you grow up um, with that kind of messaging, that kind of environment, that kind of example, um, if you will. So that's one side of the coin. It poses a challenge and depending on the, uh, how extreme the, the eating disorder in the parent, the the pathological eating stands, the, you know, the belief system is the, 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 the you know, depth and, and or the challenge may be different. But the other side of the coin is that one thing that family-based treatment has taught us is that 
even parents that are in many ways challenged themselves can actually put that aside in the in the good care of their children in the interest of caring for their child um so you know parents who are active alcoholics can 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 do fpt with a kid with anorexia nervosa parents who are mentally ill themselves um can can participate effectively in an fpt model parents with active eating disorders can participate effectively not every parent with an active eating disorder can participate effectively but many parents with an active eating disorder can participate effectively in refeeding their child and sitting there um you know i don't know if you've ever participated or you know have imagined what an fpt meal must be like especially at the beginning right so this kid who's eaten nothing and now this parent is sort of empowered and taught to say it is my responsibility as a parent to feed you adequately and we're going to do it um that's not an easy undertaking and and many parents with serious uh challenges um can can overcome their challenges or put their challenges aside in the best interest of the care of their child so it's a yin yang i think for some parents this becomes a barrier and you need to start thinking about plan b what's what's the next approach to this um and for some parents this is just a, a challenge but not an insurmountable one uh, so i don't think we should discount the fact that um even parents with serious issues themselves uh can parent their kids appropriately especially when guided well and and you know under their notion of of their love and care for their child Okay, well, um, right now, since it's nine, um, we're going to transition to the meet and greet. So I do have additional questions that we can answer. Um, Colleen has nicely put up the, uh, the link as well as the password. So we will see you there shortly. Okay, thank you so much.